Ever wondered how quantum mechanics mirrors classical physics? Welcome everyone. Today, we dive into the fascinating transition of perspective from Schrodinger to Heisenberg. Watch as the Heisenberg picture exposes the hidden connections in the laws of motion. Let's get started. In this uh, problem, what we're tasked with doing is to work out the operator P in the Heisenberg picture that is a function of time for the system in example 6.7, which is dealing with the harmonic oscillator. And then comment on the correspondence with the classical equation of motion. Okay, why do we care about this picture? Well, this is trying to connect the quantum with the classical. And we will be able to see how those things interact very quickly because it's actually kind of cool how it comes together. So with this, I'm asking you, are these equivalent? If so, how? Now, before you start formulating your thoughts, let's consider something here. In the Heisenberg picture, the wave function is constant in time and the operators evolve in time. Whereas we have been working in the Schrodinger picture where the wave function evolves in time and the operators are constant. This is a completely different dynamic to deal with. And it reminds me of that opening picture where we saw how in the top right, we saw how a transitionary kind of flow chart was made. And this reminds me of transforms, okay? And in particular Fourier or Laplace transforms, when we have something, we transform it, we operate in the transform domain, and we transform it back into the original domain. That is an illustrative idea of what I'm interpreting this as, although it's not quite the same technically, but we'll see here that with the annihilation operators, that's what happens. And also note that the, um, the uh, transformations are acting kind of in the same manner. Okay, there's a much broader discussion to be had about that and the interpretations of quantum mechanics, but that is a discussion we can have in a group chat or something like that. Very fascinating stuff. Um, but yeah, with that, don't forget that uh, there is a PDF and this one you're probably going to want just to keep in because I, I try to keep as much detail as I can in these uh, uh, slides, but some of it is just I have to keep out because it's just redundant almost but I have to get it all out on paper for myself. So feel free to get that, to access it using the link below. And of course, if you find value in this content, you can have a direct impact on its success by liking, subscribing, sharing with a friend, or donating through Buy Me A Coffee. No account required. So with that, let's dive into this fun question. All right. Stop number one brings us on a journey with the opera operator transformation acting on a test function. Okay, what do we mean by that? Well, first, let's recall that in example 6.7, we're dealing with the harmonic oscillator and that we know that in the, uh, in the Heisenberg, or yeah, in the sense of the wave function, it's time independent for the Heisenberg picture. So we know that we can have the eigenvalue equation used quite nicely and that's what this is here, okay? The reason why is because we are trying to transform using the um, operator and time translation, which is equation 6.72, which tells us that if we want to if we want to transform an an observable p, we sandwich it between the adjoint and itself, and then this is the transformation as you see color coded. Cool, not a problem. But because these are operators, we need to act on a test function, which we see in green. And that's why in the line below it, we see that I broke it up specifically to where we have a uh, structure where we can substitute in the definitions, but realizing that U of T and then everything to the left needs to act on a test function. Okay. And since we're dealing with the harmonic oscillator in this example, and we're following the method of that example, we know that the uh, everything surrounding that needs to be with respect to the harmonic oscillator solutions as a test function. So no big deal there, but with that, let's see what these definitions are. And here, much like we saw with parity, um, translation, and uh, 
uh, distance. Um, I don't know why I'm skipping. But translation, parity, rotation, we see that these exponentials all play a role. So no shocker there. So we plugged it in, uh, remembering that this is the adjoint for this one. So a plus sign there. Again, remembering that the Hamiltonian here is um, Hermitian as well. So we're fine there. But then over here, we have a negative on it, so just be a little wary of that. And then the uh, p hat operator, which we have to go back to chapter 2 to find, was written in terms of the annihilator, uh, the uh, addition, and or the latter operators. I keep, they're referenced as annihilator operators in other texts, so I keep that in mind. But with that, this is the foundation that we're dealing with. So now we have to see what these things do together, and then we can... Uh, factor out a test function and see what the operator itself is that being said our first note here is that this h hat acting on this function here which we saw in the infinitesimal cases can be extrapolated at in a couple sections ago so just consider this being the hamiltonian acting on the wave function and we know that that gives us back an energy state so keep that in mind for our next slide let's get to that one Cool. So as stated, with the Hamiltonian acting on the wave function, we get an energy state back. That's what I'm trying to highlight there. So with that, we're good to go. But now we realize that this is nothing but a number. This thing is nothing but a number. So it's a scalar and we can put it out front, which is what we do here. All right, cool. Not that bad. Pretty good there. That being said, we still see that we have um, the raising and lowering operators that need to act on the state. Now let's recall that this was uh, stated in equation 2.67, which you can see over here if you don't remember. You know, going back and in the PDF, I have them all listed out to start, but sometimes we have to go back to our old definitions. Um, also, a reminder that this needs to be uh, right distributed into these two operators. So you have two wave functions that need to be raised or lowered. So just be aware of that. And then of course we have the um, this operator here due to this Hamiltonian that needs to act on this state and this state. So notice that we have an N plus one here and an N minus one. That gets correlated to the energy states here. Okay, so just be aware. It is a little weird to see in this operation style mechanics that we have going on right now but be aware that we need to now simplify these energy terms before we can do anything else so let's get to that thus bringing us to stop number two which we can now utilize the uh, energy formula to simplify the transformation equation going back to this we saw that equation 2.62 gave us the en energies Okay, and then e n plus 1, all we had to do is put an n plus 1 here and an n minus 1 here, as you can see highlighted in red. But noticing that this h bar omega can be distributed to this 1 and this minus 1, and then you get the n plus 1 half back on both, you see here very quickly that it turns into e n plus h bar, so we just get a plus h bar here, and then a minus h bar here with the e n formula. And we want it this way so that when we plug them back in, we can get cancellations as we see below. All right, so plug in the simplifications of the energy states. Cool, we like that. Now what we're left with doing is distributing this. Well, let me change colors. Uh, distributing that exponential into this one and this one. And after that, we see that, you know, when multiplying exponentials, you can add their powers. Cool. And then you see we get a slew of cancellations here. This one canceling with that. This one canceling with that one. Awesome. Easy to deal with. But then be, if you look at it very carefully, you see that after we distribute the ith bar into both terms here in order to recombine uh, and actually cancel out everything, we see that the h bars cancel too. Thus, uh, once we get it all canceled out, the purple cancel bars cancel the argument uh, with the fraction. The reds only cancel the H bars. So just remember that taking a step by step, you'd cancel these first 
before canceling those. That way everything is nice and compact. But let's go ahead and clean up this equation so we can see what to do next. All right. So after all of that and we simplify it all down, um, we could see here that we're just left with an, a positive I omega T, thanks to those H bars canceling, and a negative I omega T. Weird how this happens, right? Or maybe not. It's kind of how it was constructed. But very cool to see. That being said, that after the simplification, we can regather back to the ladder operators and factor out the test function and then evaluate what the operator statement itself was. Okay, so you see here that everything in the green that we had gets recondensed back into the operator formulation, and that brings us back to psi n. Everything here gets reformulated back, and we get a psi n. And thus, we can take both of these size and factor it out. That's the goal there. And just like we saw with the commutator brackets or operators in general earlier in the book, we're trying to do that. That way, we can get the wave function out and just evaluate what the um, operator is itself. So now that we've done that, let's continue on to stop three. Oh, now that we're here at stop three, let us focus on formulating this transformed operator in terms of the original position and momentum operators. Okay, so uh, again, the the raising lowering operators, the ladder operators, annihilating operators, whatever you want to call them, they don't give us much insight into how um, the Hamiltonian, not Hamiltonian, the uh, Heisenberg picture or Heisenberg transformed operator relates to the um, uh, the classical operators of momentum and position. So we also know from chapter two that we can sub in via 2.48 what the operators were in turn, what the ladder operators were in terms of momentum and position. Cool, no big deal. Noticing here that we have uh, a common factor here, so we can pull that out, which you see will get canceled in the next step. And then distributing these exponentials into the blue parentheses and green parentheses respectively, we can see clearly that we have a nice a bracket to evaluate. And as you can see, you might expect some of these some of these things to cancel. Although this is a perfectly acceptable answer, it is not what the author wants at this time. So let's go ahead and simplify this bracket down and we can conclude with a couple final results. All right. So how do we simplify those exponentials? Our good friend Euler comes to the rescue once again. Okay, so after plugging in Euler's identity and then distributing everything accordingly, again, please keep track of the minus signs. There's a couple of them floating around and also realizing that they're gonna cancel. Just be careful. Again, in the PDF, I have it all step by step. Here I have it combined a couple steps. Um, that being said, we get some cancellations as we were expecting. We get rid of a lot of nice stuff and we're left with I, 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 and everything. And as you see, we get two copies of I P cosine stated here, two of the I M omega X sine. Cool, we're good with that. As you see, the negative two I and the negative two I hidden here can be factored out. Cancel that with the two from the um, operator constants simplifying. Okay, just be aware that this positive, in order to factor out a negative, we had to have a negative, so that's the only sign change there. Then, of course, the negative and I squared cancel, because I squared is negative 1. Awesome. No more complex to deal with. So we can, do, we can now transition to a um, classical perspective. But this only works because here, after I'm done simplifying, I get P hat cosine minus M omega X hat sine. But these are the zero point operators in the Heisenberg picture. So we can write them down as Heisenberg at T equals zero since we know that Heisenberg in the Heisenberg picture, the operators evolve in time. And so with this, we can conclude uh, that we solve for what we we're actively after, which was P hat in the Heisenberg picture for some later time T. Now what's cool about this is this is identical to the solution of classical equations of motion with the classical variables X and P, of course replaced with the uh, 
XH and pH. And what the author tells us in the example 6.6 .6 is that we see in the Heisenberg picture the operator satisfies the classical equation of motion for a mass on a spring. Of course, the, we see that sine and cosine were oscillating. We have the velocity term here hidden in there because we know momentum, P uh, or MV, so the X derivative. We have the position here. So this is really darn cool. And here's a cool schematic that I found that helps us illustrate these two pictures in so far as what we're seeing here in the book. Again, in the, in the Schrodinger picture, the equation tells us that the wave function evolves in time. In the Heisenberg picture, it's the operator or observables that change. How cool is that? That is amazing. And of course, all this is relegated back to base cha basis change in the Hilbert space, which we talked about in chapter three. And that's why uh, uh, Schroeder and Griffiths made us um, change bases a couple times just so we could see how to do that because guess what changing bases like this is going to happen over and over again because one formulation one picture is a lot easier to deal with so i thought this was a very cool example to see and something that we will see again inevitably so in summary thank you for taking that journey with me because i found that to be a really insightful example although the textbook does not always put all the little nitty gritty details in there. I find it very important to have that in there, even if it's just for mental clarity and getting it out of your head. Um, and so this is a really cool picture to see. And yes, all the pictures that, that were shown here will be referenced in the description. But realizing that the perspective that we take on these is both advantageous and disadvantageous because keeping track of the tools and knowing when to use them becomes a very big challenge. And then secondly, how do we interpret these tools and the perspectives that they're laid out in? Quantum mechanics is notorious for having uh, very diverse thoughts or perspective on how to interpret things. So that makes this a very big challenge, but a very fun one to try to tackle. And one that you could find infinite amount of videos about. So we'll leave that for a later discussion. But with that, I want to give a massive thank you to my supporters for making this possible. I'm extremely grateful for your support. And this stuff is only getting more intense and more fun, so your support is definitely needed. If you'd like to see more, you can also become a patron for access to the supplemental material, current and future projects, and one-on-one -on -one help. New content is posted dang near daily at this rate to fuel our curiosity. Books, notes, and other reference materials are found below, and if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out. As always, thank you for watching, and until next time, stay curious.